Hi, I'm Tom Bloomer. We're filming this at the Lausanne base in Switzerland. Today I want to talk to you about leadership. I've been in, in YWAM leadership roles since the end of 1975 and did my dissertation on YWAM leaders actually. And I find that we don't understand what leadership really is. I believe that if God is love, then leadership must be a manifestation of love. Our topic today is leadership. And it, it's of course a very important subject for us all because we have all been under leaders. We are all leaders in some way. And leadership is the greatest source of hurt in many people's lives, going back to their parents, or the greatest source of blessing. And I'd like to invite you to think about the leaders who have been a real positive influence in your life and also think about why. What did they do that was different than some of the others that may have been more negative experience? So it's important that we think biblically about leadership. And ever since I started getting into this topic, it was during my doctoral studies in the 90s, for one class on leadership I had to read several books and articles all on supposedly on a biblical view of leadership and I found not one that could tell me what servant leadership really was and I find this true even in YWAM that we lead out of our cultural models of leadership although we talk about being a Christian leader what we actually practice and and even sometimes what we teach is very much a cultural model. Uh, we've been convicted by the Lord in YWAM International that our model of leadership was much too much based on the business world. And we intentionally have dropped that vocabulary from our, our leadership structure. But let me give you a, a way of looking at leadership that has really helped me. And I've been sharing this since 1998, uh, 17 years now, and it's helped a lot of other people as well. And it goes back to the, the most useful leadership teaching I got in my graduate studies, which was from a guy named James McGregor Burns. And he came up with this, I believe, in the 70s, if I remember right. And it was, it was what he called, there are two types of leadership. And let's, let's go through his vocabulary because it, it gives us a way of talking about leadership that, as I say, has been very helpful in, in YWAM and in other Christian organizations. And he said traditional leadership in the, in the past was what he called transactional. In other words, the, the whole model is based on transactions. And it's a power-based model. And the word for power in Greek is dunamis, it's the same word we get dynamite from. And it's very much the, the leader is in charge and he is in control and he tells people what to do. I do not think that leadership should be thought of as telling people what to do. Although sometimes we have to do that as leaders and sometimes I do that in my leadership role in the university. But it really, this method really works by force. You're forcing people to do things that they often don't want to do. And the force for us is not physical, but it's, it's every bit as much force as physical force is. You tell people what to do, where to go, you give them a direction to follow. And the model, of the, and they wrote leadership books about this in the 80s, the model for the Christian organization was a factory, and the leader was the engineer of the factory. And in this, in this factory model, you get stuff in at one end of the factory, there's a process, and you have an output, output at the other end of the factory. And they said this is what a Christian organization like, is like. This is like a mission. You get, you get people in, you get uh, understanding in and how to do missions, and there's a process of preaching the gospel, and out the other end you have churches. And this is very much a factory model and people are treated like machines 
And there's no difference for an engineer between a person in a factory and a machine, except usually that the machines are better cared for, because they're more expensive. And the job is all about transactions. In other words, I have something you want and need, you have something I want and need. So I will give you my time and my skills, my, and you will give me a job, which usually includes money, not always, <laughs> and it also includes a, a certain social status and a place in society. So we are, we are doing a transaction in our job. And we monitor each other in how well that transaction is going. In other words, it's another way to look at it is reciprocal concessions. I concede my time and effort to you, you concede some of your money to me. And there are, there are contracts. Not all of these contracts are written down. Usually they are, even within YWAM, but if they're not written down, they're implicit, they're there, they're understood, and there are guarantees. You have to be here a certain number of hours a week, you have to show up at a certain time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's an authoritarian model. The, the people who are leading are very much in charge. In French, we still say, and we used to say it in English, they are my superiors. I hate that language. I just hate it. Because nobody is superior to anyone else. We all have the same value before God. And it doesn't matter our place on a flowchart does not make us superior to anyone. And then McGregor Burns said there's another type of leader. This, and he called it the newer type, the transformational leader. And he said, this, this type of leader is very different and works very differently. And he, he doesn't exercise power, but he has authority, or she has authority. And the word for authority in Greek is exousia. So when Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives his disciples exousia. He says, all exousia, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, therefore go into the nations and make disciples of all nations. And this word is mistranslated in certain languages as if there were no difference between authority and power. Well, there's a great deal of difference. And the, the simplest illustration is when a policeman stands on a street and holds up his uh, hand and stops a truck, he's not doing that because of power, because the truck has the power to run right over him. But the policeman's doing that because he has authority. And that uniform and that badge gives him the authority to stop any vehicle. So they're very different concepts, and we, we should be careful in our, in our translations. And if you're studying this, I'd encourage you to look up the Greek. And some people misunderstand this when they, when they get hold of the concept of transformational leader. They think, well, that, that means um, I'm not a strong leader. Wrong. Wrong, because who is the greatest transformation leader of all time? It's Jesus, right? And he is a very strong leader, but very tra transformational. But in this, um, in this model, the leader works through influence. Not power, not telling people what to do. Uh, leadership is not telling people what to do all the time. And leadership is not talking all the time either. <laughs> Some leaders think that they, they lead by talking. <clears throat> well, of course, we have to talk as, as leaders. And as Lauren says, we, we lead through teaching in YWAM. But it's very much an influence. And the first part of that influence as a leader has to be modeling. In other words, we model what we are asking people to do. We do it. And then we ask them to follow along in our example. So if we want people to be on time, we have to be on time. If we want them to be at certain places, we are there too, et cetera, et cetera. It's very much a modeling thing to start with. And then the other part that's so important is a vision. We give a vision for people to pursue. Now, any leader can be visionary, um, and even transactional ones. Adolf Hitler was one of the greatest visionary leaders of the 20th century. He had a 1,000-year vision for his nation. 
But the transformational leader also is visionary and calls people to, to imagine with him a certain vision of the future. And that's what vision is. It's a, it's a potential reality of the future that we can help to shape starting now. And the leader says, come with me, follow me, work with me, and we will shape the future together. And of course we do that through our obedience to what the Lord has told us to do and through our prayers. But the, the stating and restating and clarifying and deepening of the vision are a very important part of leadership. And one mistake I have made in my leadership is to think that if I've shared a vision once, then I don't have to share it again. And that's not true. And, uh, and a lot of people say you need to restate the vision and reshare the vision a couple times a year, a year in your organization. Some even say once every three months you need to lay out the vision again. And the model here is not an engineer in a factory, it's more a politician in a community. Now for most of us, I would say politician is not a positive term, <laughs> but, uh, and that's because there's so much wrong leadership in the nations, so much unjust leadership through politicians. But the point is that uh, in, a, in a democracy at least, the politician is there because the people have chosen that person. And everyone agrees that that person should be in that leadership role whether it's in the parliament, in, the, in a nation where judges are elected, or the executive is elected. So in YWAM, we are all agreed that Lauren should be in the role that he has, still leading our mission after uh, 55 years now. And we never voted whether Lauren should be our founder or not. That's a joke. but. We, are, we still have a very broad and unanimous consensus that Lauren and Darlene should be our leaders. So that's our, that's our model. And with the vision, along with the vision, the leader shares a life program. In other words, values are very important. We're going to this direction, to that goal, and this is how we do it. So you have more and more companies in, in the business world very much onto this model because it motivates their workers. And sometimes we think, oh, in my way, it's, it's so hard because we have, uh, we have to work with volunteers and they can leave any time. Well, that's no different from the business world. The turnover in the restaurant and hotel business is 80 to 90 percent of employees every year in many nations. And Peter Drucker, one of the main management teachers to the business world in it was probably the 80s where he had his most influence. He studied volunteer organizations and he told the business world, you guys should treat people the way the, those organizations treat their volunteers. Because they, they're keeping their people and motivating their people a lot better than you are. So we do work with, uh, with volunteers in YWAM, but that's a blessing. That means it should improve our leadership style. So, as I said, many companies are saying, we are we're selling this stuff, but we're doing it in a way that benefits uh, the planet. Then there are other companies, more and more actually, who are saying, um, come and work with us. We have a value of getting along together and having fun at our company. So, they will not hire disagreeable people. Uh, and part of the interview process is not just some person working in human resources, your work team, who you will be working with, interviews you also. And they have to ac accept that you come into the team. It's not, the company won't send someone that they've never met to work in their team because the team dynamic is so important and such a high value in that company. So they will, the other members of the team interview you as well as the human resource person and, uh, and they will not hire disagreeable people. I think that's great. We should do that in YWAM. <laughs> Not that anyone listening to this message is one of those people, of course. So, part of the value and the vision is, is transformation. Come work with us and you will be transformed. The planet will be transformed. We will all be transformed. You will be transformed. So there's also an opportunity for, for individual growth. 
You've probably heard that recently the, the guy, the director of Starbucks, has promised every employee that they can have their, their university tuition paid by the company if they sign up with the online uh, University of Arizona program. They already gave every employee health insurance, which is, which is rare in the states, including part-time employees. And now they've told everyone, you can get a university education. And this is a, a model that many, that many other companies are, are studying. Because Starbucks wants, their coffee frankly isn't that great, but what they want is that you are motivated to come back because the barista is such a friendly person. They know your name, they know the coffee you order every time, and that's how they get people coming back into their stores and paying more than their coffee is worth, frankly. So I'm not against Starbucks, I go into their stores too, but um, that's what's going on at that company. So you, you may have a contract, but what, what's more important is it's a commitment. You are committed to these people, to this vision, to this set of values. And they are committed to you, as I said, for your personal transformation as well. And of course there's a great deal of freedom in this because the employees, everyone actually, is so highly motivated that, they're, that people are free in their jobs and they're not locked in like they would be in a, as a machine in a, in a factory. So when you line these up together, you can see that we're looking at a very different type of, of organization. And what, what this is, is this actually two different views of humanity, of human beings. Um, because one looks at the human being as a machine, as a source of what I want. The other one looks at him as a, as a fellow human with just as much value as I have. So, the transactional organization looks like this. And it, think of the organization that you have been part of, your different schools, your different jobs, maybe your different churches, YWAM bases, groups. A transactional organization has many rules, and the emphasis is on compliance, is on obeying those rules. There's little tolerance for diversity. People tend to dress alike, talk alike, and people who are very different are not welcome. There's also an emphasis on hierarchy, on who is, who is in charge of whom. The lower downs on the organizational flowchart are treated differently from the higher ups. There are privileges, there are reserved parking spaces, executive dining rooms, etc., etc. And because the leadership model is high on control, one passive control method is withholding information. So the leaders do not share what's going on uh, in and around the community. Decisions are announced, not processed. It's leadership by announcement. You can go to a staff meeting and hear an announcement that will change your life or ministry forever, and you have not been included in that decision. You have not even been informed before the staff meeting that that decision has been made. This is wrong, friends. Do not just decide people's lives all by yourselves in your little leadership group and announce it to them. And loyalty overcomes truth in this organization. Loyalty is much more valued than truth is. So truth tellers are obliged to leave the organization because they come to the leadership with the truth of something uh, that's wrong, that's unjust, that maybe even against the law. And that's seen as disloyalty. They're called truth tellers in organizations. We call them in the church prophets. But in a transactional organization, the prophets are not welcomed. In the, in the time of the, uh, much of the time of the people of God, they were stoned between the altar and the entrance of the temple, Jesus said. So the truth teller is obliged to leave the organization, not welcome, or some places kicked out. And um, that's a very dangerous place for an organization to be in because the prophets are the ones who see not just the vision, the prophets are visionary also. 
The apostles see the vision, but the apostles see it so clearly that they are tempted to get there by taking shortcuts. And the prophet's uh, focus is on how to get there. It's on doing things not just God's will for the future, but God's way. And Lauren has said over and over that the prophets are needed by apostles because the prophets give accountability to the visionary uh, uh, ministry of the apostles. So when the, when the prophets or the truth tellers have to leave, then the, the organization loses its clarity on the ways of God. And, and injustice can multiply. And there are many, many, many examples of this in the business world and in the church. And in churches where it's essentially a one family leadership thing, it's especially dangerous. Um, they just went through this in the church of Korea, unfortunately, where the pastor of the largest church was not holding his son accountable. And his son went through three marriages and three divorces, started five businesses with church money, and each one of them went bankrupt. The son finally went up, ended up in jail, and the, the father was convicted also of collusion in the crime, but because of his age, and because he didn't really probably understand what was going on, he was um, given a suspended sentence. A very sad episode in the church in Korea it shook the nation, as a matter of fact. But there was no prophetic person there next to that apostle, apparently, to hold him accountable. He didn't hold his son accountable, and the whole thing was a major mess. Anyone, any leadership team will talk about accountability. Very few of them actually do it in comparison. Here's the question we've learned to ask young leaders who want to join us. And here, this is it. Who can tell you no? To whom in your life have you given the right to say no? Don't. Don't do that. Or stop doing that. And that has to be a right you give someone. And that means you're going to listen to them. Who are you really going to listen to who you can trust to tell you no if you're getting off? If there is no one like that, you're in a very dangerous position. And we're not sure that we want you to join YWAM unless you accept that accountability factor that we're going to tell you no when you're getting off. In this organization, the transactional organization, there's also a huge emphasis on departments and compartments. It's the silo uh, structure of an organization. Uh, in other words, you walk into an office, you ask for some help, and they say, no, that's not my job. I ran into this in my seminary, and I was, I was a part-time student at first. I had never had an orientation to the campus. I didn't know how things worked. I would go into the office I thought I should be in, and they would say, no, that's not my department and they look back to their computers, they wouldn't even tell me where I should be going. <laughs> it was just, no, that's not my department. That's not my job. You can leave. And uh, I found that very frustrating. I'm sure you've run into this as well. The transformational organization, on the other hand, it looks very, very different. And there, because it's a low control model, and we have probably the lowest control of just about any organization in the world, we are certainly the most decentralized organization in the world. In this model, personal initiative is encouraged. And that's very liberating, of course. People love to work in this kind of organization where if they get an idea of something that could be done, they go ahead and do it. And YOM is still, in most of our operating locations, the ministry where it's the easiest of all to start a, a new thing, start a new ministry. That's not true of all of our operating locations, unfortunately, but it's true of most of them. And this model is not as marked by control, as I said, but by trust. And there's trust at all levels. The leaders trust the followers, the followers trust the leaders. Fulfillment of each worker is a stated goal. And this means practically on our basis that, that workers should be encouraged to continue their education. 
every single staff member should be encouraged to have a study program, a growth program. Through seminars, through our U of N schools, uh, through other types of stuff. It doesn't have to be uh, YWAM or U of N. It can be a personal program, but it, it should be a, um, a, a program where you're studying and learning and growing in what you do. Creativity and diversity are promoted, are encouraged in this organization. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> one of the factors of the creativity of a team is the diversity of the team. So studies have shown this over and over that the more a team is, is diverse in its gender, age, nationality, linguistic background, personality type, that diversity leads to more creativity. And that's one reason that we are also the most creative organization in the world. Young people and anyone divergent is promoted, not only welcomed into the organization, but promoted. This is why we have a lot of divergent people in YWAM, because <laughs> they're not welcome in, in some other organizations. People are not uh, controlled by rules, but they're encouraged to imply, apply principles. This is the principle we go by, okay, you apply it. And as we said before, the leader is not the superior. The leader is a co-worker. One of the most successful companies back in the 90s was Intel and Andy Grove run it, a Hungarian refugee first from the Nazis then from the Marxists. He uh, was a brilliant guy, a genius actually. Came up with these chips that powered almost everybody's computers. But he, even though he was genius level, he was founder of the company, director of the company, no assigned parking pl place for him. He got the closest place every morning because he was the first to show up. And all the offices were the same. He had the same size office as everyone else. And he was, he was sending a powerful message throughout his company. I am not your superior. You are my equal. I value you and I need your creativity just as much as the company needs my creativity. So in this type of organization, information is available to all. More and more companies are putting their financial information on their websites so that uh, their employees can see them. And there is mutual accountability. It's not just that the worker is accountable to the boss, but evaluations are done at a 360 de degree evaluation, they call it. So you are evaluated at your performance by your leaders, by your followers, and by your peers. It's a full circle, 360 degree accountability. I am the international provost of the University of the Nations, but I'm on a first name basis with everyone. I taught in a school last week, and I think all the students were in their 20s, just about. And I finally persuaded all of them except um, one young man that they should call me Tom. So I understand that for, in some cultures, an older, white-haired person, it's hard for us to use first names, but nevertheless, we do that as a rule in the organization in order to make the statement that it's not about a hierarchy, it's not about people being more important than someone else. And we want to be accessible, and we want to be open to the truth. We're going to work on a way in our new university record system so that every student can evaluate their school and that we will know in, in university leadership much more of what is actually happening in each school and that uh, the evaluation will not just be the student getting a grade from the staff, but the student will be evaluating the staff and the school. Now, on many bases we do this already, but we're gonna um, put it in the system so that we can do it worldwide. Decisions here are never announced, but they are processed. It doesn't mean that everybody decides. That's a recipe for very slow decision-making process. And even Japanese companies who used to work like this have abandoned it because you cannot make a decision fast enough in this rapidly changing world if everyone decides. But everyone can participate, and that's all most people want. They want to know that they have been heard. But a small group usually has to do the decisions, 
and they then they can say thank you thank you everybody for your input over this last week or this last month we've appreciated all of it there's been a difference of opinion and we have decided we're going to go this way we understand the reasons that the people thought we shouldn't go that way and we have evaluated those and appreciate that input but this is our decision and if people know they've been heard that's all they care about they will go with the decision the way we do this in YWAM is for example when we got the name the Lord gave me the name University of the Nations the new name for our university which was originally called Pacific and Asia Christian University um, that was accepted by the the 200 leaders in that room where Lauren was leading this process in Manila in 1989 I think it was but um, still we put the name out because this is such an important decision we put it out around the world through our leadership teams and said every staff member please pray about this is this the name I think it was a three-month process the name was not final until everyone had had a, a chance to process and pray about it and nobody um, disagreed which is a, a huge miracle and it shows it was from God <laughs> So there's participation in the decisions, but still the leaders have to decide. The small group that carry that responsibility have to, have to decide. The structure is de-emphasized. We don't care about the structure. Um, in the beginning of the university, when people were still getting used to the idea, people would say, well, we want to pay our student fees, where do we send them? And some people were in the university were, were wanting a very rigid um, program of who from which nation had to send these little fees where and and I, I said no I said send them wherever you want to we'll sort it out <laughs> we don't care just just do it and we'll sort out the structure later and that's exactly what happened but the structure needs to fit the vision the structure is not the most important thing and a lot of leaders think it is and they when they want to change things they decide to restructure to change the structure and that usually doesn't make a whole lot of difference or it shouldn't anyway and it should be definitely flexible and change when it needs to especially with growth there's a great respect for the individual here the individual is valued as if that person were created in the image and likeness of God that's a, a, a neat thought, isn't it? And if we really believed that, we would treat people differently. And of course, this, this organization, as I said before, is visionary. It's definitely visionary. And the, everybody uh, knows the vision, understands the vision, understands the outwork of the, of the vision at the local base level, at the national level, as well as, as Lauren's overall vision, which of course is related to the ultimate vision which John saw and wrote down for us in the book of the Revelation well I was studying this stuff and thinking wow this is pretty good this uh, McGregor Burns guy he got he got a lot of things right and then it was <laughs> I was in these doctoral studies and still maintaining my leadership role in the university I was associate provost at that time through the 90s and then Uh, I was thinking, I, I heard someone else talking about two types of leaders. I've heard this before, where is that? And finally I slowed down enough in my studies to remember who that was, and that was Jesus. <laughs> that would be Jesus, who talked about two types of leaders. And I think we have, we have so underestimated his, his words in this passage in, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 20, and of course also his example. Matthew chapter 20 so I'm sure you know this passage the mother of the sons of Zebedee who was pretty certainly um, Salome and she would have been Mary's sister so the aunt of Jesus came up to him with her sons his, his uh, cousins James and John and bowed to him and and she said, I have something to ask you. And, and he says, what, what do you wish? 
And she says, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. And Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, sure, no problem. And they hadn't the faintest idea. If the Lord ever asks you that, don't say, yeah, that's not, that's not going to be a problem. And he said to them, verse 23, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and my left, that is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And on hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers, because they'd certainly been wanting to ask the same question themselves. They just didn't have their mother handy. <laughs> and here's, here's, the, uh, here's what Jesus says about leadership. This is so important, friends. You know that the rulers of the nations, and that word is translated Gentiles in English, almost every time it's used in the New Testament, it should be translated nations. The rulers of the nations lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And as I have taught this around the world, this, these two types of leadership, some people say, and it's actually written in some, in some leadership books, some Christian leadership books, as, um, well, that's not in our culture. One book I read said, well, transformational leadership is it's common in some cultures, but it's not in others. It's like it was, it's, a, it's a choice, you know, you can choose. So people in YWAM have said, that's not in our culture, we don't lead that way. That's exactly what Jesus said. He said, you're not to lead according to the cultural models of leadership. You're not to lead like the rulers of the nation. And if you are leading according to your cultural model of leadership, you are pretty certainly not leading like Jesus. Your leadership style is not biblical. So change it. And don't play the culture card with this. Because Jesus said the, culture, the cultures of the world are wrong when it comes to leadership. It's so clear. And these are the words of Jesus himself. And we still don't get it in the church. One of the great thinkers of the church in the last century, Leslie Newbigin, anything he wrote is worth reading. But he said this, we should not even try to teach leadership in the church because our understanding of leadership is so far from being biblical that we will certainly get it wrong. Well, I'm not, I don't think it's quite that bad because I talk about leadership and many of us do. But we are really, uh, I think not understanding how God set up the universe and leads and leads it. For example, in this area of thinking that transformational leadership is is weak leadership, we have some leaders now who think that um, they shouldn't say no to anybody, and that's not true because um, we are leading people who are less mature than we are, who don't know as much, and we're going to have to say no. And they, I was asked once recently, well, is it right to say no? And if, we, if it is right, how do we do it? And my response was, well, has God ever told you no? He's told me no. But how does he do it? He does it in such a way, although it may be difficult at the time, we still know that we are loved and accepted. And that's how God says no with us. And we should lead like He does. And this is the other thing that we need to grasp in the church is He does not control the universe. He could have set it up that way. He had the power to do that and He still does. But He has a low control model of leadership. In other words, He leaves leaves us with so much freedom, so much initiative, that we can sin. We can do wrong things. We can disobey Him completely. We can leave Him. That's how much freedom He leaves us. 
And he still is our leader. He's still our God. And so we need to really think deeply about this and understand that leadership is not control. It is not. Because God is the leader of this entire universe and it is a low control model of leadership. The reason that he does not control everything is that there is no control in love. As Comenius said, the great Czech Christian educator, there is no control in love. But many of us conceive of leadership in an organization or in a Christian school as control. I decide for everybody. And I tolerate very little diversity in behavior or points of view. Uh, that, that is so unbiblical. And we're moving in, in some ways in many nations toward more and more control by governments. Visas are becoming harder. Work permits are more difficult. Um, regulation of life at all levels, including private, private schools, Christian universities. More and more control everywhere we look. And that's the, the opposite way from which we should be going. And this is why there is a blessing on, on any kind of group or organization that, that promotes diversity and disorder, frankly. We do not have an orderly, tightly organized university because that's not the type of world we have. And we want enough, enough disorder, enough creativity so that we can see new things happening all the time. So we try to, we try to channel that new growth uh, put it into the right package, but we try, our, our goal is never to say no in the University of the Nation. Okay, getting back to the 12 here, you can make a very strong case that Jesus stayed on with his disciples well after they knew how to preach the gospel, cast out demons, and heal the sick. He stayed on with them for as much as some people think three years, and it was because they still had not got the difference between Jesus' kingdom leadership that they were going to be called to practice as leaders of the church and their cultural models of leadership because their cultural models were all wrong. Now think, about, think about the Twelve. Their leadership models were, were Herod, the corrupt king who was very much into privilege and power and had the power of life and death. The power of the Roman authority, of the Roman occupying army, and their religious leaders, especially of the Twelve, because most of them were from the Galilee, which was Pharisee country, their religious leaders were Pharisees. Very much into privilege, as, as Jesus condemns them for in Matthew 23, when he pronounces the seven woes. So, the disciples, even here right at the end of Jesus' time with them, are still asking the questions of, uh, of rank and, and privilege. And earlier they asked the question of power. Once they knew how to cast out demons and do miracles, one of their good ideas was that Jesus didn't appreciate too much was calling fire down on a village of the Samaritans. Oh, we have this power. Okay, well let's use it and call fire down on these guys. They insulted us. So these questions always preoccupy the mind of the transactional leader and are a certain mark of the transactional organization. It's power, rank or position, title, and privilege. And uh, those are the questions Jesus' disciples were asking. And of course, most of us come from nations where the leadership is just as transactional. And every single leadership model we have had, whether in politics, in a job, in the church, or even in our families, every single leadership model has been transactional. So we tend to lead out of what we have seen in leadership models. And it is very difficult to change one's leadership style. <clears throat> I find that two areas are of Christian thinking are hardest to change. One is the role of women in leadership, and the other one is transformational leadership, especially if our background has been more into uh, transactional. 
Now, the other thing that happens is that even as we start to move in transformational leadership and we're trying to get away from that transactional power model, when stress comes up, we revert to our original model. And that's when we know that we're not, we're not free. But transactional leaders are not new in this world, of course. They go back to the garden when the serpent came and said, hey, you're not getting enough privileges from this phone plan. Let me propose a different phone plan to you. You'll get much more privileges, many more privileges, if you listen to what I say instead of listening to what he said. So it was a transaction. You, you're going to get more if you do what I say. And... Uh, of course, that's the same strategy that the, the enemy tried with tempting Jesus. Worship me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And we believe that Jesus was given a vision um, right then by the enemy of all the kingdoms of the earth. And because he is the prince of this, of this earth, he had, the, he had the authority to give Jesus all those kingdoms. <clears throat> but of course that temptation didn't work. Another really clear example of transactional leadership is um, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when the people came to Samuel and said, um, we want a king. And Samuel was very unhappy with them and went and complained to God. And the Lord said, they're not against you, they're against me. And of course this whole thing was Samuel's fault because he wasn't holding his sons accountable. And the people were looking at the behavior of the sons and they said, we don't want those guys to be our judge. We want a king instead. But what they were really saying is that they didn't want the Lord ruling over them and establishing a prophetic judge as the one they went to for their decisions. But they wanted rule by a human being and not God. So... The Lord said, well, I'll give him a king, but you go tell him what that king is going to do. So Samuel went back, I'm, I'm summing it up here, he said, the king will take his, your sons for his uh, army, he'll take your servants for his palace, he'll take your daughters to be his perfumers and bakers, he will take a tithe of all your animals, of all your produce, and he will, essentially, he will he will lead you into hard service. And the people said, we know that, we figured that out, basically was what they said. But we want a king to go out and come in before us, in other words, to, to lead us to war, in, into battle, like the other nations. So they wanted the security of transactional leadership. Security and conformity. And those are very powerful human motivations. The need for security, of course, is the greatest need that we have outside of air, food, and water. And governments in Europe, for example, that underestimate people's need for security and don't punish criminals and uh, don't control their borders, and it, it, those governments are being voted out quite regularly. Because people need security. They need to feel secure. And in leadership, that is, a, that is one of our roles, is to provide security to the people following us. And we do this through consistency, through modeling, through being available, um, through answering our emails, for example. It's a, it's a boring part of leadership, but it's, it's got to be done. But this is why people stay with the transactional leader. I always get the question when I, when I preach this message, in churches as well, what do I do if I have a transactional leader? I say, leave. <laughs> leave. Just get out of there. Vote with your feet. And it's very, very difficult for people to do. Because if they've been in a trans transactional organization for years, loyalty is valued, and those who leave are, it's announced to everyone that they're being disloyal. So they don't want to leave, because they know what will happen. And they have a certain security in that, in that conformity, 
and in that transactional leadership. Okay, but really, what should you do when, if you realize you're in a transactional organization? First, you should pray. You should pray that God would change them. Then, do the principles of Matthew 18. Go to the leader and lovingly, after you have prayed, lovingly confront them. Say, listen, the way you, you treated pe that person the other day in, in public, that was, uh, I was very uncomfortable with that. And I would just want to tell you that I, th I think it's wrong. You know, be gentle, be, be non-confrontational, but you do have to confront them. I call it caring confrontation. The Bible calls it speaking the truth in love. If they don't listen, come back again with one or two others. So you are two or three. If they still won't listen, leave. If every person left transactional leadership, there would be no more transactional leadership. Of course, if you're in a nation, it's hard. <laughs> if you're in a job and there are no other jobs, it's hard. But if you're in a church or a YWAM base, it's not hard. Leave, please. Just leave. Just an, and I'll mention a couple more biblical examples. Of course, the, the original transactional leader was Satan. And in all the European languages, when you deal with the devil, we call it selling your soul. There's that, that idea of transaction in it. I give my soul to the devil, which is what he wants, and he gives me what I want, which is usually power or fame or money. So, and he is also the, the, the high controlled leader in this universe. The place that is most controlled is hell. The place that is least controlled is heaven. On earth we're in between, literally. Now we get this mixed up because we see God being transactional with Israel. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy 28, was this very detailed list of curses for disobedience to God and blessings for obedience to God. And we see God working with the transactional style with Israel. He says, you disobey and all these bad things are going to happen. You obey and all these good things are going to happen. Well, you have to be transactional when working with immature people. And at that point in Israel's development, they were very immature. This was before they had crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. The Lord was still forging them into a nation, whereas before they had been a band of refugees. And you have to be transactional when working with small children. There have to be consequences. In the preschools that my wife began, they, she would write out the rules on a piece of paper and post them at eye level, little kid eye level. And she would read the rules to them. So one little girl was doing something, standing on her desk or something, and Cynthia said, that's one of our rules. You can't do that in this classroom. And the little girl said, show me which one. So she, Cynthia took her over and pointed out which rule it was. The well, little girl couldn't even read. <laughs> But it was this idea of there are rules and I got to do this because it's a rule. That's fine with, for a little kid. But when we get to DTSs, people shouldn't be doing the right thing just because it's the rule. They should be doing the right thing because it's the right thing. They shouldn't be playing the drums after midnight in the Lausanne main lecture room, for example. <laughs> Not because it's a rule, but because you love your brothers and sisters. But the Lord's goal for Israel was not to rule them through law and, and, and sacrifice and all that. That was a teaching strategy. That was so that they would grasp certain fundamental concepts. But his goal was always to lead them through love. Which is why he said even through the prophets, do you think I'm interested in the blood of, of bulls and goats? He was the one who told him to sacrifice those animals. But then he says to the prophets later on, you think that, that that blood is what interests me? And there's a revelation of his father's heart, even in the Old Testament, that then is, of course, greatly amplified in the New Testament. We're going to close this hour. I'll just leave you this, with one thought I had, that even after I taught this for years, just, it just uh, shocked me, although it shouldn't have. And here's the thought. 
Leadership is a manifestation of love. Leadership is a manifestation of love. Or it should be. But in my mind, even after teaching this, even after trying to live it for years, I was still not associating leadership with love. And I think many of us don't. But if God is love, then he leads through love, for love, by love, with the goal of love, in the manner of love. And that's exactly how we should lead. That it may not always feel like love for the other person, especially if we have to say no, but if we say no, it's because we love. In other words, we want the highest good for the other person. And that's our old YWAM definition of love, desiring the highest good for the other. That's how God leads, and that's how we can lead by His grace. Amen. Okay, in this second hour, we're going to apply this, these principles to our religious life. Because most humans understand religion, any religion, to be transactional. In other words, um, I do things to be blessed by the divinity. And this is the fundamental way that uh, Islam works, folk Buddhism, animism, Hinduism. You have to do certain things, certain ceremonies, certain rituals, certain sacrifices in order to receive divine blessing. Now, Christianity is not like that. But we think it is, partly because, as I mentioned in the first hour, the Lord does work with Israel in a transactional way. And we need to work with immature people in a transactional way also, such as brand new street converts in a teen challenge house that has this kind of ministry to people on drugs and just converted. For example, there has to be a very rigid schedule, no free time, <clears throat> everything directed, no liberty to leave. That's just how it is working with immature people for their own good. But our goal as Christian leaders, even with those kind of people, as it is with little kids, it's, to, it's that that structure would be temporary and it's there to encourage them in their growth as the laws and sacrifices were for Israel. It was to encourage them to grow into a relationship of love of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit and not just relating through, through the sacrifices and, the, uh, and everything else. Because the Lord was very clear about this even in the Old Testament. He said, you pray but your heart is far from me. God does not want our sacrifices or our, um, the minutes we spend reading the Bible or the minutes we spend in prayer. We spend in prayer. He doesn't care about our actions or our minutes or any of that kind of stuff. He wants our hearts. And if he doesn't have our hearts, none of that will please him. As a matter of fact, it will make him most angry, as he was with Israel. Contracts are needed when we don't have love. So the, in any organization, the less love there is, the more contracts you have to have, the more laws and consequences for disobedience. Back in the 70s, someone counted up all the laws in America at every level and counted up two billion of them. Now I'm sure there are many more than that now. And when you, when you look at just the, the income tax manual for the Internal Revenue Service in America, it's, it's a thing this thick. And that's just one tiny little area of national law. So, the more love there is in an organization, the fewer rules. One thing that uh, I'm, I'm tired of in YWAM bases is the same announcements over and over. If you use a car, please check the oil and bring it back with the gas tank filled up and don't leave your coffee cups in the car. Could everyone who has 
base silverware or coffee cups in their rooms, bring them down to the kitchen, please. We don't have enough. We could have the same announcements, just record them and play them every week in, this, in every base in the world, because they're always the same. Why do we have to announce that stuff? It's because of lack of love. That's the only reason. In heaven there will be no rules and only one announcement, which won't be needed anyway. And that, and that announcement will be, you shall love. That's all that will be needed. So more and more Americans now, when they get married, they don't see it as something that, that love is, is really going to last for their whole lives. They see it as temporary and it might go away, it might disappear. So they go and they get a contract. They do a contract before a lawyer that spells out the, the rights and responsibilities of each, of each partner and where the, where the stuff goes after the divorce. And the contract is needed because of lack of love. So this is why Paul wrote to the Galatians so strongly, is that they were set free by the gospel, by the message of the gospel, by Jesus himself, but they were going back into the idea of thinking that the, they could do certain things to gain more of God's approval. Well, nothing we can do is going to make God loves, love us more. But God actually does covenants and not contracts. Technically, a uh, covenant is a one-way decision to bless. We always, there's a, in a sense, it, it then becomes two-way, of course, but <clears throat> when, when God called Abram, it was not a contract. And Abram didn't even, wasn't even looking to be called necessarily. And he didn't have any merits to be called. He was a liar and a coward, a Middle Eastern bargainer, and God just decided to bless this one man. It was a one-way decision to bless him, give him a son, and multiply his descendants, and bless the nations of the earth through this one nation that his family would become. He deserved nothing from God, but he got this incredible uh, blessing, which was a covenant. If we think we have a contract with God, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is that he didn't sign that contract because he doesn't do contracts. The good news is, one of the reasons he doesn't do contracts is that the blessings he has for us are so huge and so fantastically wonderful that they wouldn't fit into a contract. So I started out, I remember when I was a student in this place in 1974, um, thinking that I was not worthy to ever be a leader in YWAM, that I was just going to be a follower, and that was fine with me. But I had wasted too many years in selfishness. I didn't get saved till I was almost 24, which seemed really old at the time. Now I'm much wiser. So I didn't, I didn't have any idea of the blessings in front of me, and you know, here I am now, after dropping out of university twice, uh, the provost of the coolest university in the world, there's no way I could have imagined that. No way. Any contract I could have done with God would have been miserable compared to the blessings that I have received. The other reason he doesn't do contracts is that a contract implies that the two parties are more or less equal. You have something I want and I have something you want, so we'll sit down and negotiate until we come to an agreement. Well, God is much too big for us to imagine that we can negotiate with him. We still try. We're always trying to bargain with God. Even if we don't say that, we, we, we act like we think we can get God to love us more or approve us. Um, Peter saw how hard it was to be saved and that it was difficult for the rich to enter heaven. And then... And he said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What are we going to get out of it? What is in it for us? Which is a very honest question. And a lot of missionaries have the same question as Peter, only we're not as honest and open about it. We, we kind of think that because we've been in missions, we've been faith missions, and we've followed God all these years, that God owes us. We have a contract with him. Well, Jesus answered Peter, Peter, you 
And these guys are going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And whatever you have left behind, family, house, land, you will get it back a hundredfold. But it's not a contract. In other words, I'm paraphrasing what he said because what he actually said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So it's not something you can earn. It's God's decision to bless. That reference is Matthew 19.27, by the way. So throughout the biblical account, one way to read the Bible is God working with Israel, but also individuals, to move them out of a contract relationship into a covenant of love. Abram, we already mentioned, who, who got to the point where he was ready to give his son out of pure love and obedience, which are the same thing, by the way. as John tells us about 20 times in his gospel and his epistles. There is no fundamental difference between obedience and love because love is expressed through obedience. And obedience is made easy through love. So then we have, uh, we have Jacob, the trickster. God worked with him for decades to move him away from his lying and, and tricking people and swindling them, basically, into uh, a relationship of, of love. Job, the classic one. Job says, I have done all these things. No poor person, no beggar ever went away hungry from my house. I sat in the gate and fulfilled my civic responsibilities. I did all, why did these bad things happen to me? Job thought he had a contract with God, and he found out that he didn't. So. We tend to think that we have this, this contract. And we tend to think, I know I did as a, as a good Protestant, I will, I will do most things right and I know I'm, I'll do some things wrong, but I'm just hoping to end up with 51% good deeds in my life and so that they'll slightly outweigh the bad ones and then I'll kind of I'll squeeze into heaven. And that's so often the idea of we, that we have of the Christian life. And if we want to be more spiritual um, and get closer to God, then we have to do more of certain things, like pray and more Bible study. And we have to do less of other things, like we have to sacrifice. We have to sacrifice uh, food, um, sleep even. We were taught right in this room in the, in the 1970s that if you wanted to get closer to God, you should sleep less. So we were taught to just set our alarm clocks back at least 15, 15 minutes uh, every night and we would get into sleeping less and be closer to God. I, I decided to settle for five, but I didn't make it through the first week, I think. Well, this teaching is not only wrong, it's stupid. We need eight or nine hours of sleep at night, and for most of us, nine is better. The man who first started telling us this out of Fuller in Southern California was called a heretic and not invited back to many churches. And it's really bad for your health to uh, get less sleep than you need. It's why many people are burnt out. And one of the best things you can do for your health is sleep as much as your body wants to sleep. If you're an adult, if you're a teenager, that's probably not a good idea. <clears throat> but even teenagers, they figured out through studies, should not have to go to school at 8 o'clock in the morning. They're just physiologically not ready for that. But that's what we force them to do because everyone knows that all the meetings should start at 8 a.m. That's a law. It says so right in the Bible. I can't find the verse, but it must be in there somewhere because we all do it. There is nothing we can do to earn God's favor. What God did in a world where everyone thought his favor had to be earned was he sent his son to die on a cross. And that's finished. That's over. Another symptom of, of having or thinking we have a contract with God is that we think he owes us explanation. We have given him our obedience, but now uh, 
nothing bad can happen to us because that's the contract we have. Or if it does, then God has to come fix it right away. And if, if that doesn't happen, then at least we, we are owed an explanation. And of course, that's what Job was after through 38 chapters. And God never, ever gave him one. He just started in chapter 38 asking him these nuclear questions that Job had no answer for. And gave him, a, through those questions, a new revelation of his greatness. And then Job was left with worship. And that's when the Lord blessed him again. But it was not to do with the contract. So when our world falls apart, as it did with Mary and Martha when their brother got sick, we, we want God to do something immediately. They knew that Jesus loved their brother. In the message they sent to him in verse 3 of John 11, it said, the one whom you love is sick. They didn't ask him to come and heal because they knew he would. They had that kind of contract with God. But Jesus did not sign that one. So, their world fell apart. Both these ladies went into shock to such an extent that when Jesus finally appeared before them, each one said separately a public rebuke with no greeting or anything. They said to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus had something greater for them than they can imagine in their little contract. He was going to resurrect their brother. So, if we're thinking that God has to do, solve our problem on our timetable, that's the Pharisees. That's exactly what they thought. They said, validate yourself as Messiah. Do a sign right here in front of us right now. And Jesus never did. Because they thought in their Pharisee and heresy that God's power was available to them on their terms and on their timetable. And we think that too because at times we're disciples of the Pharisees. Well, it's not because he doesn't do contracts. He doesn't heal everybody. He doesn't raise everyone from the dead. He doesn't always do miracles. Winky Pratney used to say, asking God to do a miracle is asking him to testify against the faithfulness of his creation. Which is a thought that stayed with me for many years. And this, this thinking we, ha we have a right to explanations is the Sadducean heresy. Because the Jews sought for signs, miracles to order, but as we said, the Lord never explained things to Job, Jesus never explained everything to the Sadducees, and he never did a miracle for the Pharisees. Because he is not encouraging us into the idea that we think we have contracts. Here's a thought that I, I think I read last year, the year before. Are we using God to solve our problems, or are we using our problems to get closer to God? And that, friends, is a, is a very big difference, and it, it expresses the difference between a transformational relationship with God and a transactional one. Here's another symptom of having a transactional relationship with God, and that is unforgiveness. Because if, if that person hurt us, we think they owe us. They owe us rest, restitution, or at least they should say they're sorry. He shouldn't have done that. He's a Christian. How could he do that? And we hold that against them. We don't forgive. And, that, and the Lord hates that. The Holy Spirit really hates that. And this is why. And in, with this message, I received another revelation of the cross. Because a lot of things happened on the cross. And... It's in the epistle to the Colossians that we learn about more of them. Um, because it wasn't just our sins that were forgiven. It was victory over the enemy. But in the forgiving of our sins, it says in Colossians 2.14, uh, 
he canceled out the certificate of debt concerning the degrees, decrees against us and which was hostile to us and took it away having nailed it to the cross. And this is what I think this verse means and that is our sins were certificates of debt. We were in debt to the devil. He had a right over us because we gave him that right through sin. And those certificates were canceled, but at a price. And they were, the price was they were nailed to the cross through his feet and hands. So when we hold a sin against our brother, the Holy Spirit remembers that day when those certificates were all nailed to that cross. And Jesus died to take those certificates away. But here we are holding the certificate still. He owes me. He should not have done that. He hurt me. And the Holy Spirit is grieved and will leave. So that's another reason to forgive. If we needed another reason. The Lord called us to be a trans transformational organization. And this is why in YWAM we don't tell people where to go and what to do. Now some leaders do that, but they shouldn't. As leaders we should never, we should never do that. I had a revelation just I think three years ago or four years ago after preaching this message for so long. Here's what the Lord told me. YWAM leaders lead YWAMers. <laughs> I said that in the LTS that happened here about three and a half years ago and the only one in the room who got it was Jim Steyer who was leading the, leading the LTS. He said, wow, that's profound. Everyone else said, well, of course they lead YWAMers. That was a stupid thing to say. YWAM leaders lead YWAMers. What was the Lord saying to me? He was saying, I have called this organization to be composed of people listening to me for their direction. That's why we teach hearing the voice of God in the first week of DTS, but it is not just for the first week of DTS, it's a way of life. It's the core of our epistemology, it's the, it's the crucial part of our unity, it's fundamental to everything we do. The Lord is leading us, each YWAMer, so no leader should be able to say, you go here and you do that. I have the fear of the Lord upon me in this area. I would never, never do that. And I think part of that comes from the organization that I was in before YWAM was the U.S. Army, where they're very good at telling people where to go and what to do. But then I was confronted with YWAM, which in the early 70s was so unorganized that in the 72 outreach, the, the YWAM staff were betting each other whether or not we could pull it off because most people didn't think that YWAM could pull off an event where you were having to take care of a thousand people. Just one example of that, uh, the big meeting tent that they had to rent for a thousand people um, was put up out in the back yard of the little chateau, the Schloss Horlach. And they told this story when we first got there. Yeah, we went out to find the tent and we ordered one and we brought it back and it just fit exactly within the garden limits. And everyone was, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And I'm thinking, you could have measured the space, you know, before you went and got the tent. <laughs> they didn't think of that. They just went to the, order a tent and prayed and the Lord blessed anyway and he directed them to get the right tent so praise the Lord right anyway even in uh, even in worship and this again is my own personal reaction because of being in the army probably um, I don't think we should be telling people what to do I decided to leave the army because I was tired of that and I decided to join YWAM because I didn't want that kind of lifestyle. So when I have a worship leader telling me, stand up, sit down, hug the person on your right, shout to the Lord, shout louder, shout to the Lord louder. Oh, we had one like that in one workshop. When I, uh, when I am leading like the application after my, one of my messages, I invite people. 
Because I think that's what the Lord does. He invites us. He doesn't force us physically to do things. And as YWAM leaders, we can invite people. We can challenge people. We can put a vision before them. <coughs> we can say, there's this need that I think you can fill it. And then our next phrase should always be, please pray about this. Lauren does this all the time. If he meets you and likes you, he'll invite you to move to Kona. He invites probably tens of thousands of people every year to move to Kona. <laughs> He's inviting me to move to Kona. Well, he did that once in 1983, and I did move to Kona. But I'm not doing it anymore, but it hasn't stopped him from inviting me. Fine, we should be inviting people. We should be showing them alternatives and, and challenging them to come up to new levels. That's not the same as telling people what to do. When YWAM began, missions was defined as white people who were mostly male and a certain level of education and were married and could have children but not too many and they couldn't be too old and they couldn't be too young. That was the missionary type. And women were accepted too because there weren't enough men obeying God. But Lauren refused to work with that definition so we could not join the North American <coughs> umbrella organization of all the North American missions because you had to decide how many missionaries you had, North Americans in other words, going out to all these other countries that needed the gospel. And Lord said, no, all of the YWAMers are missionaries, including the ones in the other countries. And this is such a new thought for those guys that we couldn't join that organization until the 1980s. So YWAM is the first organization that said old retired people could be missionaries. That children have a role in missions. That young people have a role in missions. That every Christian in every nation <coughs> has a missionary role. Has some kind of role in missions. He was the first one to say that in Korea. He says, God is calling you to be missionaries to the whole world. They said, no, we can't. We, they won't even give us passports. That was the dictatorship time. And we don't have any money. The main export out of Korea, the first time Lauren went, was human hair. It's the only thing they had to sell that anyone wanted to buy. There was one pastor who heard the challenge and went with it. And now, of course, it's widely accepted in Korea. And Lauren was one of the first to say that in Latin America, in Brazil, for example. So this idea that every believer hears the voice of God and can sharpen their hearing through practice and discipling and understanding. And every believer should obey that voice of God and that voice is probably telling you to go somewhere at some time anyway, even if he calls you to stay in your hometown ultimately. That's why we am. That's who we are. And we must, we must lead with the fear of God on our lives. YWAM leaders lead YWAMers. But, as we see everywhere, that cultural and religious models of leadership creep in more and more as our, as our organization grows and as it matures. And we need to realize what God has given us, and I'll say it one more time, our leadership is not to be like the cultural models of leadership around us. It is not. Because the controlling and hierarchical one is satanic. Jesus came to do things differently. And the way he did that was to die on the cross. And first he lived among us and, and modeled it. And then he died on the cross. He died for our transformation. And that is our predestination as the church, is to be transformed into his image. And of course, this is our dream for the University of the Nations, that the University of the Nations would be a transformational university. So much of education has been transactional, heavily transactional, very much hierarchical. Um, the whole grading system, where grades are seen as kind of a punishment, and, and good grades are reserved for the tiny minority. And, and there are a lot of people who join YWAM because of educational wounding. And they, they see in YWAM a place they can, they can get an education um, and work in a place that's totally different.
all the nations were under hierarchical spiritual authority. And this hierarchy is laid out for us by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6.12 and Colossians 1 verse 16. And the diabolical power over the nations, the prince of this earth, had to be broken. And the way God broke it was to send a baby. Send his son as a fetus. The father sent his son into the womb of this Jewish te teenager where he grew for nine months and was born as every human baby is born and grew up as every baby and child grows up. That's how this diabolical control over the nations was ultimately broken. He was sent as a lamb to be slain. And when he died on the cross, Colossians 2.15 tells us that it wasn't just that our sins were forgiven individually, it's that he triumphed over these principalities and powers and led them away captive, including the guardian spirits holding back each nation from its destiny. That control was broken for those who wanted it broken. For those who still wanted to stay in that transactional spiritual relationship, they're still under it. And now, after Jesus ascended to heaven and received all authority, he shares his authority with us and sends us into the nation with this message of his transforming power. And it's not just individuals who can be set free and transformed, it is entire nations. And we, we're here filming today in Switzerland, a nation which was largely set free through a series of revivals, the most powerful and best known one we call the Reformation because it didn't just revive the church, it reformed every area of society in ways that we're still studying so we can, uh, we can follow in that path. When we are transactional in our leadership, are we not feeding that same hierarchical, diabolical method of leadership that Satan has? But when we become more like Jesus and accept the working of the cross in our lives, we are breaking out of this system and it has no hold over us. And we lead through love. The lamb is the one who is also the lion and who has all authority. The angels worship him before the throne and a day will come when all the nations are there before his throne as well. Because he accepted death on the cross, he was given them the authority, the victory over death, and authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. And this is the, the authority of love that he will share with us, and that we can also employ in the leadership role that he has given us. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for your life and your death, resurrection and ascension. And we pray that you would so transform us that we would lead more and more and more like you. And that you would make YWAM and our University of the Nations models of transformational leadership so that we can bless the nations the way you want to bless them. We thank you and praise you today. Amen.